Welcome and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Balling. I'm the director of public health here for the city and county of Broomfield. And what an amazing turnout. Last year, I think we had two people show up and we have a full room. So first of all, give each other a hand for coming out because this is a great city, so it's a great turnout. Secondly, I want to say on behalf of the staff and from the bottom of my heart, we appreciate what you guys do on a daily basis to protect our residents from foodborne illnesses. And it's due to your commitment of what you do to, for food safety. But additionally, the amazing food that you do cook and put out in Broomfield. I mean, I'm often going out and frequenting your establishments. And so it's, it's nice to see you here and also actively engaged in this process. Um, wanted to share a little bit about the uh, forum that we're offering today. This is a chance for us to provide the latest updates in what's happening with retail food establishments um, as far as the regulations and the inspection program that we have in place. But more importantly, it's a chance for us to learn from you. So we hope that this turns into a dialogue and discussion versus just a one-way presentation from us. And also for us to, for you all to learn from each other. Uh, so an opportunity for sharing best practices or stuff that you're doing in your specific establishments that may be useful for somebody else to use. So we really want to engage everybody. Hope that you feel comfortable speaking up. Um, we don't get offended by anything that you may have to offer or say. And obviously, we take all of this information to help continually improve what we do. So with that, I want to introduce our amazing staff, but then also go around and have everybody introduce themselves, um, the establishment that you're with, and then what you hope to get out of today. So Dan, I'll let you start. Brit Gamboa, I have been here for five years. I'm Kim Burke, and I've been here for five years as well. It's on my five-year anniversary with Broomfield. Well, welcome. I'm Brit, and I'm one of the inspectors. And today, um, we're going to be covering a couple of things. But well, my subject is going to be covering the 10 major changes um, now that we are adopting the new FDA uh, code. We're going to cover some. They are not all of them, uh, because we have more changes on the regulations. But I will present the top most wanted. <laughs> So let's start with person in charge, demonstration of knowledge. <clears throat> so what has changed uh, for a certified food protection manager? We can go to the next slide. So at least um, one person has to be a certified food protection manager. The person that is uh, an employee with authority to control direct food, um, food preparation and service should be certified food protection manager. And um, the food protection manager will be required at most establishments, not all of them. Uh, all depends on, on what type of menu you have. And the certification needs to um, come from an accredited program, and I will pass you a handout on that. Uh, I will give you some resources. How this will protect public health. Well, it's coming, it's okay. Food protection managers have an important role, as you know, uh, to prevent and verify that all the employees are following the policies and procedures. Um, and the main thing is they are gonna be teaching best practices to prevent foodborne illnesses as they have more education with uh, the certification. And I'm going to pass this, some handouts. Could you pass them? Thank you. I guess all of them. Yeah. And those two, I guess, yeah. So I'm going to pass some resources from CDPHE. And they are the acceptable food protection manager training um, resources where you can get uh, your certification. So we'll go to the next one. So I would like to present 
um, and introduce executive sous chef Zach Barnes, who graciously accepted our invitation to talk about date marking. They have been already actively um, adopting this for a while, and he's from the Omni Hotel. Please, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so with regards to the date marking of time and temperature, control for safety foods, uh, the seven day date markers required on certain ready to eat, time temperature control for safety foods. Uh, date mark is required only if the food is held for longer than 24 hours. So if it's for immediate service, uh, that would mean uh, it does not need to be marked. Uh, the date the product is made or the date of the oldest ready to eat food incorporated into uh, the final dish is uh, going to count as the first day. So if you have chicken today that you are cooking and then using tomorrow, uh, you're basically at a six day shelf life uh, rather than a seven day shelf life. Um, uh, how does this affect us as operators? Uh, the foods need to be sold, served or discarded uh, within that seven day period. And this protects the public health by controlling hazards related to microbial growth. Go to the next slide. All ready to eat time, time and temperature control safe for safety foods held longer than 24 hours need to be date marked for use, service, or disposal from seven days from the born on, or as previously stated, uh, seven days from the oldest prepared ingredient incorporated into the dish. Um, with the exceptions of commercially prepackaged deli salads, uh, cultured dairy products, preserved fish products, um, or shelf stable dry fermented sausages, pepperoni, salami, etc. Next slide. Um, there are also exceptions for hard and semi soft cheeses, uh, such as these listed below. Um, and I'd like to just speak a little bit about how my property implements uh, date labeling and ensuring that it's done consistently and accurately. Um, so we, we do this for three reasons. Um, primarily for the safety and health of our guests, um, because if we're not protecting that, we don't have guests anymore. Um, as well as for the good of our establishment, um, it, it improves uh, the quality uh, of the food that we're serving when we're paying attention to shelf life um, and makes for a better final product. Um, and third, uh, it protects our financials. Um, so the way in which we ensure that uh, date labeling is implemented is uh, to take it one step further than just instructing our associates to uh, label and date food properly. We actually incorporate uh, a checklist into our HACCP logbook so that on a daily basis um, we're not only looking at uh, holding temperatures on, on hot food and in cooling devices uh, or looking just at the way that we cool down product. Uh, we're also going a step further to ensure that our dry storage and cooler spaces are kept clean and organized. Uh, and so that means um, putting food into the proper size container um, ensuring that labels are transferred over. Um, and, and every single day, there are associates looking through, through every cooler space, organizing it, ensuring that items are dated. Um, we also like to use uh, the label that we use, uh, we get it from Cisco, uh, has additional information. Uh, it has obviously the product line uh, for what it is and the born on date and the discard by date but it also has a built-in date dot uh, which makes it very simple for people to look and, and identify just at a glance uh, whether or not the product's going out of date and it also has a space for uh, the preparer's name so that we can hold people accountable for uh, whether or not the product's made right uh, if it's being cooled down properly um, and uh, and, and we found that this really helps to ensure proper product rotation. Uh, furthermore, we're, we're not only looking at a seven day shelf life on a lot of product because I think as, as any of the chefs in the room know for sure, just because we can serve it for seven days doesn't mean that's the optimal amount of time to hold something. Um, uh, there's a lot of products that 
really one day, is, one day or two days is all the life you can get out of it before um, the flavor starts to degrade. Um, and then we are also, uh, on a corporate level, uh, attempting to perform between three and four full uh, inventory rotations on a monthly basis. Um, now, this ensures that the food that we're using is fresh, but it also ensures that your liquid assets are not tied up in something that has a shelf life and is potentially going into the trash. Uh, it makes you more aware uh, of how quickly you're going to be able to use product and whether or not you really need to bring in that fifth case of chicken or could you possibly just bring in four. Um, and so these are just some of our processes and procedures to ensure proper date marking. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Chef Sack, for uh, telling us a little bit about how you implement this uh, new, new rule. Um, so now let's talk about cleanup of vomiting and diarrhea events. Um, what has changed? So some of the procedures are required in the event of responding to a diarrhea or vomiting event in all establishments. CDPHE has a document that is already, already passed that, that, ser that serves as a recommendation um, and guidance to clean up after vomiting and diarrhea. I believe they require a 5,000 parts per million per one gallon of water. How this will affect operators, all employees need to know how to clean up after diarrhea and vomiting. Um, how will this protect public health? Uh, will reduce the potential for spreading harmful bacteria like E. coli, Salmonella, um, Vibrio, and or vital path pathogens like mumps, um, influenza, chicken pox, especially for places like ours and others. So we have some um, handouts that uh, they could be very helpful, especially during inspection. We will be, during our inspections, we will be asking about that a little bit if you know how to proceed and how to clean up after vomiting and diarrhea. And number four hand washing when changing tasks. So hand, hand wash is no longer required before every glove change. If we don't have any risk of contamination, employees can change their gloves without washing their hands or changing their gloves. How will this affect operators? I think it was going to save you a lot of time by not changing your gloves every single time and washing your hands. But um, so employees will be able to change gloves without washing hands as long as a task change and contamination did not occur. How this will protect public health? Time um, mainly ensures that employees can efficiently and safely prepare food without unnecessary interruptions. Hand washing signage, that's number five. A sign needs to be posted in all, at all hand sinks. Uh, it is required that all hand sinks used by food employees uh, have a, a signage above the hand sink, very clearly visible how this will affect operators. They will have to post signs or posters at all hand sinks, and posters can be provided by um, free. Um, if you, you can download them in the website at CDPHE website, and one of the CDPH, CDPHE website. How this will protect public health. So I show that vis visual reminders increase can kind of watching frequency, reducing food porn foodborne outbreaks. Equipment. What? Oh, refill. So let's Refilling returnables. I have it right here somewhere. 
Well, we can go to the next one. So refilling take-home food containers for food and beverages is now allowed. How this will affect operators? Operators will still need to wash, rinse, and sanitize uh, the containers if it is for food or a TCS beverage. TCS beverage, um, the state changed the name. We used to call it potentially hazardous foods. Now um, it's called TCS, which stands by, uh, for time temperature control for safety. So potentially hazardous foods has been redefined to TCS beverages. And we can cover that later. Refillable containers, uh, the design and criteria and process, it will be defined by code uh, with the FDA. Non-TCS beverages will allow to be refilled by operators as long as they rinse the container with hot water. And, um, and can be refilled by customer if contamination can be prevented. How this will protect public health. Uh, this will ensure that reusable containers are durable and capable of being adequately cleaned and sanitized before refilling. Equipment. So the good news is that appliances and equipment are not longer required to be ANSI certified as long as they meet the specific criteria, which means they need to be smooth and easily cleanable and durable and safe. Uh, they must be designed and constructed so parts do not break, creating possible injury hazards to consumers. But again, they don't have to be ANSI certified anymore. Can we go to the next one? Variances, variances required for special processes. What has changed? Variances are still needed for special processes from Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment granted through your local health department. How this will affect operators? A variance can be granted if you are smoking, curing, acidifying, um, some but not all ROPs, uh, custom processing animals, sprouting seeds and sprouting beans. How, would, how this will protect public health? Um, a variance request must be granted by the local health department and approved by CD, CDPHE to ensure that food safety is controlled and there is uniformity. So it will come to us and then we will send that to CDPHE. CDPHE will say yes, so we'll give some recommendations and it will bounce, will get bounced back to us and then we will issue the approval. Now, nomenclature changes. So PHF is now called TCS. What has changed? Well, just the name mainly, potentially hazardous, has been redefined to time temperature control to, for safety, TCS. So you will hear us during the next inspection, starting 2019, to talk about, um, we will call it time temperature control for safety instead of potentially hazardous food. How will this affect operators? No change, mainly the name. However, this process by using time temperature control for safety provides a method of determining if food is non-TCS based in, on the wa food water activity and pH of the product. So like it says now, formally defines cut tomatoes and leafy greens as, well, I potentially hazardous, but it's TCS. Um, how this will protect public health? Clarifying the process. If a food can support pathogens, then um, if food can support pathogen growth to reduce the risk of foodborne illnesses. 
Now, critical and non-critical violations. We're changing the idea of critical and non-critical violations, or mainly the name, to priority item, priority foundation item, and core. Critical and non-critical are being replaced by priority P, priority foundation, PF, core, are mostly cleaning and frequency and maintenance. So how will this affect operators? Priority items will be such as food temperatures and date marking. Priority foundation, equipment, utensils, and facility. Core, cleaning, frequency, and maintenance. By using this three Four tiers, we will decrease the chances of foodborne illnesses in your facility. And again, they will be supported by the more science-based uh, ideas than we have before. And what's the next one? And that's it. That's all right. That's it. Well, thank you. And if you have any questions, um, you can also email us. And you can find the PowerPoint presentation at broomfield.org slash food safety. All right. Your turn. Um, I thought that Laura wanted to do that at the end. Yes, we will answer all your questions, so we're not going to forget you. <laughs> I, get, I, I do the lucky straw here because all I ever get to talk about is, uh, all I get to talk about in this part of the presentation is the inspection form and what it's going to look like. So I thought, okay, that's pretty cool. I got an easy one here. I got to buy. So this is what it's going to look like. It's essentially the same name of our organization. It's got uh, the same look. It's a single page. The first you know, page and a half are going to be the uh, core items that we were talking about just a second ago. And then, uh, then there's going to be a mix of the priority foundation and then the core items at the end. So it's, it's relatively easy to follow through. It's a little bit different in that instead of 15 different violations, there are now 30, I'm sorry, 40, 54 or so. So we're going to be learning where to put these new violations uh, ourselves. We're, we're going to a couple different training classes to learn how to do this. But I'm going to go through them um, for you guys just so I can outline them in, in the beginning so that the next year when you see this, you're not going to be totally caught unaware. So I'm going to start at the top. And if you just slowly scroll down for Marie, I'd appreciate it. This does follow the FDA's format for the way they um, list the violations. And of course, as far as the FDA is concerned, the most important part of food safety is you and how you conduct yourself in the facility. So the first thing is supervision. Does the person in charge know what they're doing? Do you and can you demonstrate your knowledge of food safety to us? So that literally is the first violation that we could possibly mark. And then if you know your stuff, okay, prove it to us, show your certification. So we are going to be asking for that, like Britt mentioned. Um, scrolling down, employee health. What we're looking for there is that you as managers are supposed to know what diseases look like in your employees if your employees come in and choose to work sick. So if they come in and they're jaundice or they're going to the restroom or they're sneezing or all those other nasty things, okay, I'll use the words vomiting and diarrhea, have those types of symptoms, you as managers know you got to send them home because they're at risk to your facility and your patrons. So that's, that's kind of what we're looking for for that one right there. Proper use and restriction and exclusions. On certain circumstances, it is permissible for an employee that is ill to come in and work. Let's say somebody has a rash on their hands. OK, you don't want them handling food. But they could be at the front desk seating customers. OK, that's what we're looking for there. And normally, when we are doing an inspection, we are looking at your employees to make sure that they don't have anything on their hands that would cause illness. All right, I'll say it. A sore, a cut, that sort of thing. That's kind of what we're looking for. But if somebody has that, there are places within your 
operation where they can work and still put in some time. So that's what we're looking for for that particular violation. Um, and then, you know, Britt mentioned the policy procedure for incidences regarding vomiting and diarrhea. Show us what your procedure is going to be. If all you're going to do is copy off what the state has, check. You got it. Have that there when we ask for it. A lot of this is just demonstration of knowledge, meaning, okay, I may not know what to do, but I know where the paperwork is. If it happens, I'm going to go get it and read it and do it. That's what we're looking for, so that you know how to handle those incidents. Um, let me go to good hygienic practices. Well, that hasn't changed much. Are you eating in the kitchen? Are you drinking in the kitchen? Where are you putting your personal belongings as far as uh, maybe food or drinks in the kitchen? Are you handling that appropriately so that you're not cross-contaminating patron food with employee food? That's what we're looking for there. Um, discharge from eyes, nose, I don't think I need to talk about that. We'll, we'll go on with preventing contamination by hands. Cleaning your hands. Are you washing your hands properly? Do you know how to wash your hands to the tune of happy birthday twice? That sort of thing. We'll ask you, what's your hand washing procedure and policy? How often are they supposed to do it? What happens if they change tasks? Those sorts of things. Now we do have a new guidance as far as if you are handling chicken and for whatever reason you change your gloves, you don't have to wash your hands. You just put on another pair of gloves. So long as that task hasn't changed. Of course, if you went and picked up some garbage and then went back to trying to Handle on your chicken, okay, we might mark that up. Okay, we will mark that up. You know what we're talking about. So long as you're not changing tasks, that's allowable to change your gloves. Uh, no bare hand contact still remains in place. You may not handle ready to eat foods unless you have a, an exemption. And there are a few places in Broomfield in the state that have exemptions for no bare hand contact. Um, um, number 10. Your hand washing sinks. We're still going to be looking to make sure your sinks are used properly. Do you have soap? Do you have paper towels? Do you have adequate hot and cold running water? Do you have hot and cold running water that gets there in an adequate amount of time? That's what we're looking for there. Are you using that sink properly? So the only thing should be in that sink is soap scum. For those of you that have heard me inspect before, it's all I ever want to see in your hand washing sink is soap scum, nothing else. Going on, approved food source. It's interesting that we're talking about food. We finally got the food. It's number 11 on the FDA list. Is your food coming from an approved source? And you all know that when we go in your facilities, we're looking at your food sources, at your cans, making sure it's coming from an approved source, either FDA approved, state approved, for the most part, is what we're looking for. Uh, haven't had too many of those issues, thankfully, in Broomfield. So thank you very much for your diligence. We appreciate that. We appreciate you making our job easier. And I know all three of us appreciate you guys here because at least we'll have a, a dozen or so facilities that we won't have to worry about as much. Um, food received at proper temperature. Um, this is something that's always been in the regs, but it hasn't been highlighted as much as it is in the FDA guidance. We're talking about food arriving in your facility at temperature. So you should be paying attention to that too. You should be looking at time um, uh, logs when the facility, when, when the shipper brings the food to you. What, the te what temperature are you getting it? And if it's below 41 degrees, I would question it. That's kind of up to you and, and your policy. But that's what we'll be looking at from now on. Is it in sound condition? Is it in good condition? Is it safe, unadulterated? Cans, you know, rotten fruit. Those are the things we're looking for under that particular violation. Interesting, it's number lucky 13. Number 14, required records available. Uh, for the most part, we're talking about shellfish. Um, your lobster, not your lobster, your um, oysters and so forth, any scallops, you're required to maintain a log of all of that um, shipping and receiving information for us for 90 days. So we ask for it. Um, a few of these facilities, obviously, uh, the bigger facilities have that sort of thing. More often than not, we're finding it in grocery stores or is where we look for it. Um, parasite discretion, that would be in the instance of Sushi, is your fish frozen long enough? And I'm not sure any of you are serving sushi in here. Um, number 15, food separated and protected. Same violation as before. Do you have your food stored properly inside the walk-in? Do you have raw items, uncooked things on the bottom, ready to already cooked or ready to eat items on the top shelves? That's what we're looking at there. 
do you have them below each other or separate from each other so that the, you don't get any cross-contamination? Food contact surfaces, we've jumped to cleaning of different things now and sanitization of different things. Do you know the policy and procedure for whatever type of sanitization you have? Is it a chemical machine? Is it a heat machine? Or in the case of in-place equipment, do you know what we're looking for is how to properly answer sanitizing in-place pieces of equipment with whatever type of sanitizer solution you're using? We usually ask those sorts of questions. Number 17, proper disposition of return, previously served, reconditioned, or unsafe food. And I've never, I can't say that I've actually ever seen here anybody that's reconditioning food, but it's interesting that they put that in there. One example of that would be um, if your um, hot-held product should drop below 135 degrees. Uh, is it salvageable? And what's your policy and procedure for salvaging it? If you know it's been out of temperature for less than an hour or so, you just have to reheat it to 165 degrees and then you've reconditioned it and you can reserve it again. That's what we're looking for in that particular one. Going down to 18, proper cooking time and temperatures. We ask that question of you. What do you cook your hamburger to? What do you cook your chicken to? If you have whole pieces of uh, steak and the like, what are you cooking that to? Uh, if it's cooked at a lower temperature, how long are you cooking it to? We're asking those sorts of questions under, under this a little bit more obviously. Reading procedures, I, I kind of gave you that one a little while ago. If you've got something you pre-made, reheat it, reheat it to 165 degrees. Proper cooling time and temperature, that hasn't changed at all either. You still have six hours to get something you've cooked down to 41 degrees. Two hours to get it to 70, four hours to get it from 70 down below 41 degrees. That has not changed. Holding temperature, sort of talked about that. Uh, now it is 140 degrees and above. Colorado, up until the end of this year, uses 135 degrees. After the first of the year, 140 degrees. Many of you have already, many of you already use 140 degrees as a little safety factor. Now you may want to consider bumping that up a little bit so that you have a, that safety factor available. Because now we're looking at 140 degrees for hot holding temperatures. Cold temperature, still the same, 41 degrees and below. No change there. Date marking, this is where that violation goes. Um, all the way down to number 22. Many of you already do that and use lots of different, different, different procedures to use it. That's just one, you can use whatever you want want to do so long as it gets the job done and we can tell that you are monitoring your food so that it is labeled in some fashion from good seven days later time to get rid of it. Time is temperature control. Uh, there are probably about a dozen facilities in Broomfield that utilize that procedure and have it approved through our organization. That hasn't changed at all. If for whatever reason you uh, want to do that, come and see us afterwards and we'll work you through the process to get that approved. Again, what we're talking about is if your foods drop below 140 degrees, if you have a time of temperature control, they do not have to be maintained at 140 and above. They can fall below that temperature for four hours and then after four hours you will discard that product. And lots of different places use that. Uh, pizza places for the most part because it's very hard to keep pizza hot uh, and keep it wholesome and palatable, and it's a lot easier to let it drop into the danger zone and then reheat it before you serve it. Time and temperature control as public safety. But if you want to talk to us about that, please come see us. Consumer advisory, that hasn't changed at all at either. That's where you will serve something that is undercooked to your patrons at their request. We're looking for those things on the menu. A breakfast place, for instance, will have you may cook your eggs to your choice. Sunny side over, sunny sides up, poach, whatever you want. It's not cooked to temperature. You have to have that labeled as a consumer advisory on your menu. We've gone through that a couple of years, so unless you're changing your menu, we've probably looked at that and already approved it. Um, where am I? Um, 26, sorry. Pasteurized foods, used, prohibited foods, not offered. That's more along the lines of an unapproved food source. Most of what we see these days is a pasteurized food product. There are only very few that uh, serve or try to serve some unpasteurized product. Uh, food additives, approved, properly used, that, that's always been the same. And now it's identified a little bit better so that we can see that. Uh, part of that has to do with, you know, is it approved to use in the product? And there's a list of all of the, the different things that we look for. 
and we're going to be learning to key in on those far better than we have in the past. Toxic substances uh, properly identified, stored, and used, that hasn't changed at all. That's your toxic items that you need for your facility. It could be your sanitizers. It could be your cleaners. It could be other types of things that are necessary for the proper, operization, proper operation of your facility that you have to have in there. We're just looking to make sure that if you take them out of the original container, they're labeled and that they are stored in a proper spot. Also has to do with if it is not approved for restaurant use, we would mark that violation because you shouldn't have it in there in the first place. For example, RAID insecticide. RAID does not make an approved food source, food grade that I know of, off the top of my head in this moment of time, uh, insecticide. Um, number 29, compliance with variance, specialized processes, HACCP. Uh, for those of you that have a HACCP plant, we are supposed to read them each and every time we go in there. There's, again, there's only about a dozen facilities in Broomfield that have HACCP plans, but we read them and we're supposed to review them every time we go in there and do an inspection. We are to uh, go look at your facility's paperwork to make sure that it's in order and that you are adhering to your own policy and procedure as far as a HACCP plan. Don't have too many people that uh, cure anything. For the most part, it's ROP situations where you're sealing in a bag and reducing the oxygen potential. Don't have anybody that I can think of that's curing meats here in Broomfield. And then good retail, good retail practices, excuse me. This would be uh, the uh, core type things. At one time, everything above that was critical. Well, now it, everything below is not a non-critical. It's a core violation. And 30 through the rest of the uh, inspection are core things. Pasteurized eggs, interesting. Pasteurized eggs used where required. If you have a specialized process that you, it's safer for you to set a pasteurized egg product. We're going to be looking at that to make sure you're using pasteurized eggs. Water and ice from approved sources, don't have that issue too many times here in Broomfield. In general, we just don't have that issue too many times, period. But on occasion, we'll find somebody that uh, brings in ice from a source that we don't recognize, and that's where that violation comes from. Variances, Rick talked about how to get a variance and what you go through for that. But if you need a variance for whatever your product is, we'll be happy to work your way through it. You, you write a letter to us, we turn that over to the State Health Department. We offer our approval or uh, disapproval and what we could suggest you can do to make that process better. They review it and they actually issue the variance. We do not. We just are the courier, if you will. 33, proper cooling methods, adequate equipment for temperature control. That's really about do you have the facilities to do what you're trying to do in your facility? Do you not have enough refrigerator space? Do you have enough hot holding space? Do you have enough... Um, prep space on the front counter, that sort of thing. We don't want anybody using ice as a cooling medium as a standard operating procedure and facility. So we make sure that you have adequate facilities for cooling and heating. Plant food, property cooked for hot holding. When you cook vegetables, you have to cook them to a specific temperature. We're going to be looking for that and make sure you're doing that from now on. Approved thawing methods used. That's always been there. It was buried in one of the other violations. Now it's just a little bit more self-evident. Thermometer provided and accurate. Same violation as before. Got to have a product thermometer. It's got to be accurate within two degrees. You got to know what the temperatures are that we're looking for and uh, have it upon request. You should also know how to calibrate your thermometer. So that's part of it as well. Uh, labeled. If you take something out of its original container and it's not easily identifiable, you need to label it. That's pretty much a given. 38, insect rodent control. Animals not present, that's the same as what it was before. Can't have rodents in your facility. Can't have insects in your facility. Can't have unwanted guests in your facility, no matter how many legs they have. Contamination prevented during food preparation, storage, display, that's has always been the same. It's making sure that you're not cross-contaminating things, like taking a bowl that fits in the top of a garbage can and putting it in your garbage can to prep out of it, and then taking that bowl and putting it on the prep table. That sort of stuff. Pretty simple. Personal cleanliness, are your employees clean? Are they changing their aprons if they get their apron soiled? Are they wiping their hands on their soiled apron? That violation has always been there. Wiping cloths, are you using properly? Are they clean? Are they uh, soaked in a sanitizer residual? Are they properly stored? 
in between uses. Is your sanitizer rinse clean? Same thing as before. Washing fruits and vegetables, that's the same sort of thing. But what we're looking for there is making sure you do it in a sink that doesn't cross-contaminate, for instance, the use of your three-compartment sink. There are ways that you can use your three-compartment sink to wash fruits and vegetables. And there is and there should be a policy procedure that you have written out if you weren't going to do that. Utensils, equipment, linen, same thing as before. Are you storing your clean stuff properly? Or are you storing your dirty stuff properly? Single-use uh, articles, same thing. Are you storing all that stuff properly? Get it off the floor, cover it up when it's not in use. Glove use properly. We've sort of talked about that already. I, I won't go over that again. And now we're winding down. A few more to go here. 47, food, non-food contact surfaces, are they cleanable? Are they properly designed? This goes back to what Britt was talking about, is not all of your equipment has to be ANSI approved. You know, I'm going to hold on to this when I say it. I will allow domestic equipment in your facility, whereas right now I can't. But in a few more months, I can. And we as a state can, so long as it meets the criteria of being smooth and cleanable for the conditions that you're going to be putting it through. If it fails, okay, then I'm afraid you've got to change it out. Um, that's equipment. Wear washing facilities. Does your dishwasher or your three compartment sink or whatever you're using, uh, is it installed properly? Is it functioning properly? 49, is your non food contact surface of your facility clean? Tops of things, sides of things, that sort of thing. Physical facilities, do you have the hot and cold water that you need for your facility? Your plumbing, does it work? Is it leaking? Is it dripping? Is your toilet running? Can you turn your hot and cold water off? Is it hard to turn on? That's what we're looking for for that. Sewage, wastewater properly disposed of, don't have that violation too often because everybody except for one facility in Broomfield is on public water and public sewer. But if you're dumping your mop water out the back door, okay, that's where we're going to mark that. Toilet facilities, everything in place as designed, as approved when you open. Toilet broken, okay, that's a violation of that. Get it fixed. Garbage refuse properly disposed, facilities maintained. Do you have adequate facilities for your garbage? Is your dumpster area clean? Are you keeping your dumpster closed? Physical facility, well that's the outside of your building and maybe your floor or maybe your, your, uh, the back of the uh, building. Is it graded properly? Is there trash there? Are there weeds there? That's kind of what we're looking for for your facilities. Do you have unused, broken equipment in your facility? If, if so, we're going to ask you to get rid of it. I mean, why have something in your facility that you can't use? It just makes no sense. It, to us, it's a cleaning issue. To you, you look at it as a resource. Okay, get that resource back in operation so you can use it. Uh, and last but not least, adequate ventilation. Do you have ventilation where you need ventilation? Restroom, got to have ventilation. Obviously, your kitchen, if you're producing any grease, got to have ventilation. That's where that goes. Regulatory action, thankfully, we haven't had to utilize this in quite some time. But in the event that we have issues with you, this is where that comes into play. We would check that off. And what it'll generate for us is another form as part of your inspection that we could outline where we are in the regulatory process. And last but not least, we are still going to ask you to sign off on our inspections. Same as before, our little keypad will allow you to sign on there. And instead of printing them off these days, well, after the first of the year, we're going to be emailing to them to you. So, and I will, uh, and we will take questions when I'm finished, when we're all finished. Okay, just one more presentation to go, and then we can take some questions. Okay, so I'm covering some specific violations and potential solutions, but I'm really going to focus on foodborne illness risk factors. Um, and I want to be clear that my presentation, the information that I'm covering is specific to the current regulations. So you'll hear the term PHF still for potentially hazardous foods, like Britt was saying. That's going to be TCS in the new regs, but you'll see some familiar terms in my presentation because the regs don't change until January 1st, or we don't adopt the new set of regulations until January 1st, 2019. So up until that point, we're still working under the current regulations. Um, okay, so can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so um, according to the CDC, um, foodborne illness affects roughly one in six Americans every year, which is 
a pretty significant number. So all of the work that we're doing here is really important to try to keep that number at a very minimum, if not below that number. Um, so, you know, the work that we do is really important. I know that maybe sometimes it's easy to forget that our day-to-day -day food and safety actions are important, but they really are. Um, so here's some stats that are thrown out by the CDC. Um, foodborne illness is typically caused by infections from contaminated food, contaminated by bacteria, viruses, or parasites, or maybe even a lovely <laughs> combination of all of those. Hopefully not, because... That is no fun for anybody. Okay, so we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so there's five factors that have been determined to contribute the most to foodborne illnesses. And like I said, that's kind of what I'm covering in this presentation. Um, the first one is food from unsafe sources. You heard Dan use the term unapproved sources. That's usually, that's probably what you're used to. That's what is on the inspection form and in a lot of the literature that we use. Um, so basically food from unapproved sources or unsafe sources um, is food that's not obtained from an approved source. An approved source is basically any type of facility that's typically permitted um, and licensed and regulated. Um, here in Broomfield, we are the responsible regulatory agency. Um, there's some exceptions for large food manufacturing facilities that might be regulated by the USDA or the FDA. Sometimes there's um, more entities involved, but I think most of the folks in this room are only regulated food-wise or retail food-wise by us, by the city and county of Broomfield. So everyone in this room is an approved source, <laughs> basically, hopefully. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, the next factor that contributes most commonly to foodborne illnesses is cross-contamination. Uh, and cross-contamination is when equipment becomes contaminated and then can contaminate a food source, um, which can lead to for foodborne illness, obviously. Um, I think that most of you all are pretty, pretty comfortable and aware of these these basics, but, you know, again, it's really important. It's something that can happen easily, cross-contamination. If you, I know that everyone's really busy, especially when you're in a rush. It's easy to kind of let things slide and, and you know, cross-contamination can occur really easily if you're cutting chicken, for example, on a cutting board and you're in a big hurry and you don't properly sanitize that knife, for example, and then you go and start prepping some produce. Not that anyone here would ever <laughs> do that, but you know, it's an easy thing that can occur, so it's really important that staff is properly trained and that there's active managerial controls to make sure that on a daily basis we're, we're really working hard to prevent cross-contamination. Um, let's see here. And again, to uh, prevent cross-contamination, uh, oh, sorry, Marie. <laughs> Equipment needs to be washed, rinsed, and sanitized at least every four hours, and that's at a minimum. You know, um, definitely between processes, if you're going to be switching up processes, you want to make sure, and when I say that, I mean if you're going from prepping chicken, chicken's always my go-to. <laughs> chicken's really easy to pick on. Um, chicken to ready-to-eat foods, um, it's really important that you're taking the measures you know, regardless of time frame, to properly wash, rinse, and sanitize your equipment. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. Number three is uh, poor employee health and hygiene. Um, so if any employees have been diagnosed with an acute gastro, a GI illness, um, or if you notice that any employees have symptoms of diarrhea, vomiting, uh, runny nose, runny eyes, coughing, that sort of thing, they have to be restricted from food prep and service. It's very important. Um, food workers can transfer illnesses via food, and, and really if, if one person, one sick person, contaminates a single batch of food, then that can spread to numerous people in the public, including people within your facility too. So, you know, it's really important that um, Managers stay on top of sending workers home when they need to be or excluding them like Dan was saying there's certain activities if you have a cut on your hand or if you're sick 
well, if you're sick, you shouldn't be there. If you have a GI illness, you shouldn't be in the restaurant at all. But there's certain things that, that we allow for you to do, such as handling money. You know, you, can, you don't have to send all of your employees home, but there's certain restrictions and guidelines, and all managers need to be aware of what those are. Um, and that's what the, in the upcoming changes with the food manager classes, that's going to be a really helpful thing for all of the facilities because they go into great detail about active managerial controls. Okay, so number four is improper hot hold and cold hold temperatures. Um, so potentially hazardous foods that need to be cold need to be kept at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or colder. Hot foods need to be kept at 135 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Um, and you know, everyone here I'm pretty sure is familiar with cold holding equipment, but that's your, you know, your walk-ins, your reach-in coolers, your open top. Anything that's meant to keep food cold is a cold holding unit. Um, and then anything that's meant to keep food hot can include steam tables, heat lamps, those are you know, what we see most typically, um, and hot holding cases and cabinets. Occasionally, I, I don't really ever see people using double, double boilers or crock pots too much, especially since crock pots are, uh, there's not any commercial crock pots that I know of. So under the current regs, you're not even allowed to have them in the facility. I, I see them from time to time. And, and they really make me unhappy because they don't usually hold temperature where it's supposed to be. But so in the meantime, crockpots don't even just pretend that's not <laughs> not in there. Okay, so number five, which is the last main contrib contributor or risk factor to uh, foodborne illnesses, is the improper co cooking temperatures. Um, cooking temperatures are very important because they kill the bacteria that's in the food that can make us sick. Um, or at least that's the idea. Proper cooking temperatures should be attained by, or you should be making sure that you're receiving, or obtaining, excuse me, proper cooking temperatures by using a, a throbe, <laughs> probe thermometer. A throbe, it's a new thing. Um, <laughs> so everyone should have those in all of their facilities. I mean, any, I've, I've not seen any facilities actually in Broomfield that don't have uh, probes for for checking cooking temperatures. So everyone seems to be doing pretty good on that. But the, the problem is actually getting people to regularly check temperatures to make sure. You know, you're in a rush and you've got five orders up and you're you got a piece of chicken on the grill. It looks good, you know, you throw it out, but if you're not checking the internal temperature, you really don't know if it's actually safe or not to serve. So uh, cooking temperatures are very important, really easy to look by when you're in a rush. You know, we're all human, we get it when people are are busy, it's easy to look things over, but that's our job, is to make sure that we're doing everything properly to, to avoid passing on any foodborne illnesses to the public. Um, okay, so I wanted to show you all the next slide. I wanted to skip to that, that data set that we have, Marie, from the, from the state. So every year, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, which is the state health department, for short, um, they compile this list of information. So over here in this, I know this is very tiny print. This is hard to read, but uh, I wasn't able to modify it at all. But oh, there you go. That helps. OK, so in this category, you have all of the, the public health departments in the state of Colorado that are performing inspections. CDPHE, that's DEHS, is that Denver Environmental Health? OK. So this. CDPHE has jurisdiction over the really smaller counties in the state that don't have their own local public health departments, and they typically do the inspections in those areas. In the other parts of the state where we have the local public health departments that are performing inspections, we have this data here in this column. This column shows the number of inspections. This is for the year of 2017, by the way. But this column shows the total number of inspections in each jurisdiction. And then these numbers here along the top are the top 15 violations that, based on those top, top five risk factors that I was just discussing, there's 15 violations specifically that are related to foodborne illness risk factors. Okay, so these violations that are numbered across are those 15 violations that most likely lead to foodborne illnesses. Um, 
or that contribute rather to those five risk factors that I was discussing. Okay, so this data is really just a snapshot because like I said, it's for the year specifically of 2017, this set of data here. So it's really just a snapshot of what's going on across the state in comparison to, so we can look at Broomfield here. We have 351 inspections total for 2017. And then would you mind going out to the whole picture there, Marie? On the bottom here, this is where they break down this information. And they have, in this line here, this is the average. OK, so I wanted to specifically discuss those violations that Broomfield is above average for on the rest, compared to the rest of the state of Colorado. Um, so if you go to slide number 16, Marie, Um, this shows, okay, 3B, when you see your inspection reports, 3B is a num one of the number violations, and that's for rapidly reheating food to 165 degrees Fahrenheit or greater. Um, and then this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some specific violations that, that we commonly see in this category. Um, so Broomfield, let's see, compared to the rest of the state, Broomfield facilities have been marked at 3.13%, and the state average is 2.1, or 2.22%, excuse me. So we're higher on average than the rest of the state as far as facilities being marked for this violation. Um, there's three violations specifically amongst those 15 that we're, we're averaging higher than the rest of the state. 3B is one. The next one is on slide number 18, Marie. And then cooking temperatures, that's item number 3D on your inspection reports. Uh, cooking temperatures, we're at 0.57%, and the rest of the state, state of Colorado is on average at 0.48%. So we're just slightly above average here. Um, the data does not show us whether you know, the specific types of food, or it doesn't go into that kind of detail. but. Um, and then this is not an exhaustive list either of temperature violations, but these are the most common ones that we typically see. You know, we could get into roasts and uh, there's, if you look in the regulations, it gets pretty nitty gritty about various types of temperature violations, but, or cooking violations rather, but this, this here is pretty generally what we see when we're out doing inspections. Um, hopefully everyone knows proper cooking temperatures because these are very important for food safety. Um, one thing that I learned one time was if it, <laughs> oh shoot, I'm not going to remember. It's like if it, <laughs> if it flies, okay, never mind. I'm not going to do it. I don't remember it. <laughs> um, I should have thought about that before I got up here in front of y'all. <laughs> okay, so we can go to the next slide. That, the next uh, violation that's ranking above average for the state is on slide number 23, Marie. Oh, you already got it, okay. Or no, it's 6C rather, yeah, slide number 23. Okay, so Broomfield is at 13.96%. The rest of the state is at 11.03%. So we're pretty high um, above average on this one. This typically, in my experience, is, um, well, just like it says, it's either there's no soap or towels at a sink or employees aren't using, let's see here, drying devices available obviously pertains to the uh, paper towels um, and hand drying devices, specific, you know, the verb, it, hand drying machines and paper towels. Um, so this one I would say, you know, like I was saying with the numbers, this one's much higher than the other violations that we have that are higher than average on, compared to the rest of the state. This one sometimes is very easily corrected. Usually there's some paper to towels on site that just haven't been put in. Every, I'm getting a lot of smiles. Like I feel like maybe you all have been dinged on this one quite a bit as well. It's a pretty, pretty easy one to fix, luckily, um, assuming you have 
soap and towels on site to keep your, your hand sink stocked with. But uh, it's important, you know, when we don't see soap or towels at a hand sink, it's pretty indicative that employees are not washing their hands. Or when I go to turn on a hand sink and it takes five minutes or, or a very long time for the hot water to warm up, it's a pretty good indicator, you know, that, that folks aren't washing their hands. Um, so those are the three violations within the city and county of Broomfield that are, for 2017 at least, that were ranked above average compared to the rest of the state. Um, I'm kind of, it looks like I'm, I'm out of time here. I was going to go through the other 15 violations briefly, but... Should we? Yeah, so all of these pre presentations are going to be available on our website, too. The website is listed over here, broomfield.org or, broomfield slash food safety. And our email address, if anyone has any questions, I know we're about to open it up for questions, but if there are any other unanswered questions or things that come up later, um, you can email us at publichealth at broomfield.org. And that will go to any one of the inspectors, um, and, and one of us will get back to you with an answer. Hi, everybody. Is everybody still with us? <laughs> I'm Laura Davis. I'm the Public Health Protection Administrator, and I wanted to start off by saying thank you all for being here. Um, we view you as partners in our community, and, and this is such an important topic, and I know it's not always the most exciting and glamorous, but it's one that we hold in high esteem and high value, and we certainly want people to feel like they can come out and enjoy a meal in Broomfield and feel like they're going to be safe doing that. So we really appreciate your participation. Um, I would like to open up for questions, but I also want to let you guys know, as Kim alluded to, all of these presentations are going to be available online. Um, and, and again, it's written here, and it will also, um, as you think of questions, this was a lot of information today. A lot of things came your way. So as you go back and kind of think about this and you look at your particular facilities and have specific questions, please let us know and let us know how we can help you. Um, and I also want to make you aware we're going to be sending out a survey. We're going to, we're going to uh, try and see how do we make these forums more valuable to you. Uh, what times work better for you? Is a webinar of value? What topics are of interest? Would we be better to kind of divide these into particular sectors like grocery versus a retail food establishment? So be thinking about that. And any guidance you can give us would be helpful because, again, these are for you um, to help you assimilate the new information. And this time, we happen to have a regulatory change. And so there was a lot of information that made you. But again, we want to start a dialogue. We want to make sure that we're talking with you and that it's not just once a year. Um, we're happy to come to you guys and, and do training in, in your facilities. And so there's a bunch of different options we have. And we want to make sure that you're all aware of that and that that is something that, that you know, we can have a dialogue with you about. So I guess with that being said, I'd like to add, uh, ask if there's any questions of any of the folks that presented or any other questions that come to mind from us. Please. I've got a couple. Um, you talked about the equipment, domestic kind of, and you used the term ANSI. Is that equivalent to NSF? Yes. So that's one and the same. Okay. Not um, exactly the same, but very similar. But for my purposes. For your purposes, <laughs> exactly. So what thing. you're what you're getting at with both of those is that the the main point there is that you're going to a recognized standard that has established criteria, so that we know what we're looking for. Right, and, and the reason I ask is because specifically we, we sell ice cream and we have a freezer. And there are times where that freezer might fail. So I wanted to know if I could bring in a backup domestic freezer that I never use except in an emergency situation. And it sounds like that would be acceptable after January 1st. <laughs> okay, and then uh, the, the certified food protection manager, is that what that, the terms were? Uh, safety or something like that? What if they're not there when you perform the inspection? There, in that case, or there would Do they have to be there? Does there have to be somebody at all times in the store that has been through that training? Because we'll have like four different shift, shifts that are run, if you will, and different people run those. I, I don't, I, I think that's one that we need to take back and get clarification on. I will tell you, I would always recommend, no matter what, and we will get back to you with that question, um, 
because again, this is new for us too. There's also some things about that we have to go back and talk to the state about how they're going to enforce some of these right. issues. Because well, generally, it's a Monday through Friday is yeah. your normal hours, and I have someone who works Monday through Friday, sure. nine mm -hmm. to five, and that would be the person that I would expect would do the training because then they would share it with the other people. I just wanted to make sure because I think the first line on the new report was, "Are you certified?" And if that person wasn't there that day, is that going to be marked off? And again, at a minimum, too, I would make it a documentation is always something that's important. I would always make sure that you do have whoever's been certified, that that documentation is retained at the site so that we also have the ability to see that. Put it in a frame up on the wall. What are you talking about? <laughs> People like that kind of stuff, and I like them to see that. And one last, last thing, and I'm sorry for all the time, um, the glove change this is confusing to me um, if someone's doing a similar task repeatedly why would they need to change the glove if it tore or something is that the only because i'm yeah. trying to think why would they be changing the glove if they're doing this a repeated? okay so if it were to get torn or destroyed or something like that because we're using those poly gloves or whatever the way we envision it we've seen it at least is that let's say you are working on your chicken and your gloves get so contaminated, you don't want to touch another piece of chicken. I got gotcha. you. Then you can take off your gloves, put it on another pair, okay. without having to wash your hands. Okay. The particular box you open is really messy compared to the other ones. And right. You, you, there's okay. all kinds of scenarios like that. Okay. That makes it very clear. Thanks. That was all Please. I had. Yeah, no worries. Uh, is the reason I, it's kind of a follow-up to this question on the certified food protection manager certification? Is that changed due to the 2017 food, uh, food code coming out, or is it, or is it based on the 2013? I'm Here's just asking because I, I have restaurants all over the country, and I know with the 2017 food code that is required at all times. So We're adopting the 2013 code. The 2013. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's just once, one per restaurant. One per restaurant. One per Correct. Restaurant. Gotcha. And then um, you mentioned for the receiving log that you are gonna uh, monitor the temperature at receiving. So what happens when the product is left overnight inside the walk-in? So for key drop deliveries. We will evaluate that when we look at it. I don't know if I can answer that question right now. Okay. Generally, your, your food provider has their own house of logs that they have to follow. And so they have, at, at least on mine, they have a key drop as well, and they will write the temperature coming in and the temperature leaving. And right, that, but we helpful. don't get that information in our system. That's the provider, so they have their information on their documentation. We don't necessarily have that. Our requirements is for the product to be left inside of the walk-ins if, uh, if it requires it for a duration. So I just want to make sure that the restaurants don't, are not, are set up for success and to make sure that if they need to, if we need to have a record of temperature that there's nobody going to be there, so do I need to get data loggers installed on all these walking coolers so that we can record these temperatures, or will verification in the morning suffice the requirement? Why don't you let us talk amongst ourselves, okay. talk with the State Health Department, that's how they interpret that, and we will respond to you and put that on our website so that you all know the answer. Okay. Yeah, these, these are the kinds of questions that exactly what we want to know because there's some of them that we can answer right away. But they, again, I think the state, we're moving through this process with them and we can certainly take some of these questions back. Okay. And then I had one more question for the cleanup procedure vomit. Is, does it have to be a chlorine based uh, disinfectant or can it be anything? I think any approved, EPA approved sanitizer is going to be fine. And just for you guys, because we didn't talk about this earlier, but the state is putting on training for inspectors, like about 15 sessions throughout the state, so that we have the opportunity to learn what we're trying to tell you you're going to be responsible for, because guess what we're responsible for, too. So we've written I have been through the training last month, and it is a pretty big learning curve for us, too. So don't be afraid to ask these questions, because we don't know all the answers. We will probably pretend we do, but we don't know all the answers just yet, but we will get them for you. I would also tell you that some of the regulatory requirements now actually went from being much more clear to being a lot more fuzzy. And so I think, you know, to your point about the equipment, we're still going to have to look to make sure it meets certain criteria, you know, non-porous, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
but it puts a lot more discretion on that inspector. And so I think that there's some things where this is actually kind of muddied the waters. And so we want to make sure from a consistency standpoint that we don't just answer you off the cuff, but that we're, we're talking through that with our state partners and making sure that we understand how that's going to be enforced. And not just here. You saw what Kim was presenting. We want to make sure that what we're doing is consistent so that we don't have skewed data or something where we look like we're not doing things correctly where other counties seem to be in stuff. So that's really important. I just had a quick, is there a requirement change for sandy buckets? Or do they have to have a free basket? Do they have to be like off the ground? It I mean, will, if there was a hit for it, I just want to know if they had changed that for this, this new change. There really isn't a change to it. What we will be looking at is how you place those buckets. If you're storing on the floor, there's a huge potential for cross-contamination when you take that bucket and then put that bucket on top of your counter. You've just cross-contaminated your counter. So it would behoove you to think about storing those buckets in a cleaner area so that they're not stored on the floor so you don't run the risk of cross-contaminating something in that fashion. Does that make sense? So again, the issue is more about the cross-contamination piece and not the bucket itself. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Um, you know, I'm just curious as to once you guys start doing these new audits, are, are we going to make it an emphasis with the auditors to teach through some of these questions? Because I don't think a lot of the managers are going to have a lot of understanding behind some of these changes. And, you know, no offense to any auditor anywhere, but I don't always think that the education piece is given to managers when they're walking with them. It's kind of like mark and go. Um, I really do believe that that has to be an emphasis if we want to make sure this works in cohesiveness. I think that, that that's kind of an internal as well as an external issue. Oh, absolutely. I can tell you from working, I didn't work in the food industry, but I worked in other industry, and to your point, that's kind of like the engineer versus the person that has to operate the equipment and yeah, answer the question, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for you to emphasize that on your side. But I would also tell you, this is where it becomes important to do what I said earlier, and that's if, if there are issues like that happening, we should perhaps do some training at your facility and have more than just your manager involved. But this is where we have the opportunity to come out and talk to you, and we would love to see more of that in your setting and your questions, because a lot of times we're sitting up here trying to tell you what might happen or what could happen, but we haven't seen your facility. And so we're trying to answer general questions, and you may have situations that we haven't contemplated before, we haven't seen, or maybe you guys have ideas, that uh, some best management practices. Um, so it, this is a dialogue. This is a two-way street, and I think in those scenarios, please reach out to us, and maybe we need to come into your facility and train our, <laughs> have, have some of our inspectors meet with some of your people and talk through some of these issues. So uh, again, please, please take me up on that, because I think the dialogue is really crucial. It also gives us an opportunity to take stuff back to the state. If we're seeing stuff in the field, that has a lot of credence when we talk to our state partners as well about what's happening and what things we they haven't thought about either. And so unless we're having that dialogue, that doesn't happen. Are there regulations around um, like herb gardens or you know farm to table type stuff for facilities? Give me an example. Uh, somebody has a garden box with a tomato plant outside their restaurant. Can they use those tomatoes inside for food prep? So this is the sourcing. Yes, there's no prohibition of utilizing produce from pretty much wherever it comes from in a facility like that. I know of a few facilities that have garden boxes exactly like you're talking about. I don't see an issue with that. I mean, there's no difference between what is going on at the farmer's market in the 45 minutes over uh, off of uh, 35 than what you're talking about. Okay. I know some item. restaurants in Boulder too that are growing their own herbs and yeah. they use them. Yeah. Okay. The produce as long as you're properly washing it. Right. As long as it's still being temperature controlled. Laura, I do have one other question. You guys had uh, date ranges there for a lot of the cheeses, and then you had some exemptions. What are the date rates or date ranges for those exempt ones? For example, the gardens, all of the blue cheese, those types of things. Is there is that established or is that? There, as far as I recall, there isn't one for some of those cheeses because they're hard cheeses. 
moisture content is very low, okay. so it doesn't apply to them. It's an exempt, it's truly an exemption. Totally oh. exempted from okay. date marking. Not like you can go bad or something. Huh? Well, well, you know what you go bad. <laughs> but just as long as you maintain the days. temperature, it will, for the most part, unless you're ordering stuff that you don't need for six months, it will be fine. The day ranging is, I believe, centered around protecting us from this too. And usually that's a seven day, six day growth cycle. Okay. So that's where that comes from. So the other things as you just mentioned, is high um, low moisture contact cheeses, it just doesn't apply to. Okay. So they're exempted. So you guys, this is your opportunity to pick on us or ask us hard questions and make us squirm a little bit and you're <laughs> being very nice to us. Thank Only you. Dan. Only you should make Dan squirm. Nobody else. Please. Uh, my question was, we do we do some charity events where we do off premise uh, to support that charity where they do a taste of this or a Broomfield Dancing with Stars kind of thing. Uh, in those scenarios, do, are we required to get a permit for that, or does the the charitable organization putting it together, did they pull a permit for that? I was unclear on, the, so on one of those events. Let me take that one. Um, Broomfield has not classically been consistently applying temporary event permits, um, and that will be changing in 2019. Um, one of the issues with doing that is resources. You have some of these events where they have 50 vendors or 100 vendors and we end up uh, not having the resources to be able to do the licensure and more importantly the inspections that go along with that. So right now we're in the, we're in the process of looking at what, our, what we are going to do and you'll probably find it's gonna be some type of a hybrid situation where you're already required to have commissary that's off site. So we'd be looking, do you already have a retail, retail, retail food establishment license? And then we'd be looking to license people that have no other licensure. So people that are truly just there for temporary events. And there's a there's kind of a dual system with that. Um, the vendors themselves would have a permit and then a temporary or a temporary license. And the actual people that are hosting the event usually kind of help to coordinate. And there's uh, some there's some things there too. So all of that is still under discussion, and we expect to be rolling that out in 2019 in Broomfield. So should, should we maybe if somebody approaches us and say, will you do this? Say, have you looked at the licensing piece? Have you? you know, so have what we have been doing is we did develop a checklist for some of the events, like you, some of you may know about Veg Fest that's happening next week. In that particular scenario, we did pull the regulations and we did a type of checklist that said, and we had them sign that they understand the requirements. And then we did it. We did some spot checking. We went out and did some spot inspections. Uh, again, probably the biggest thing that was seen at some of the things that Dan went out and looked at previously. Hand washing, again, was a really big issue at a lot of different of the temp events and having the proper hand washing facilities. So it, we're, we're kind of coming up with it. It's not going to be that everybody has to have a license. There'll probably be a hybrid approach to that. We just like doing them. It's just we want to comply too. Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. Well, again, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate your taking the time out of your busy days to be here. So thank you. Thank you.